Paige Omura. I work at Y Combinator. I'm on our work at a startup team. So we're the team that helps our portfolio companies hire. For this event, we'll do um, three tech talks. These will just be about a technical topic that the founders find interesting or um, a bit about their company as well. Um, and then we will have two quick pitches um, to hear about other companies and then we'll initiate breakout rooms. So with that, let's go to Jeff. I'm going to talk for five, 10 minutes or so about um, the electric airplane industry and in particular uh, energy storage. Um, I'm going to cover a few different areas. First, a little bit about um, the aerospace industry and the particular market segments that we're working on. Um, number two, some of the main technology challenges, and then some of the major uh, opportunities in the energy storage space, especially funding opportunities, which I think will be relevant for early stage startup companies. Um, and happy to take questions at the end. Um, just briefly about us, we went through YC in 2017. We're about 20, 25 people. Uh, we're based up in Albany, New York. We're funded um, in addition to private uh, investors by NASA, the US Department of Energy, uh, the US Air Force, and the US Army as well. Um, very briefly, the carbon footprint in the air aerospace industry is, is very, very bad. Um, you would have to eat vegetarian for over a year to offset the carbon from even a single uh, relatively short round trip flight. Um, we focus on electric uh, solutions to the aerospace industry because um, there's a bunch of research that's come out that um, other different technologies involving combustion, things like biofuels or electrofuels or even hydrogen combustion, um, when stacked up against um, jet fuel, aren't even you know, necessarily that much better. Um, and electric technologies have the potential to be substantially lower in total greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so what this chart looks at is not only carbon, um, but it looks at carbon, nitrogen oxides, contrails, and a bunch of other things as well, and tries to get to a total global warming equivalent. And what you see is that, um, you know, in some cases, combusting hydrogen is substantially worse, um, and, you know, electric is sort of, uh, in, in many ways, the best environmental solution. Um, when we looked at the aerospace industry, we were, you know, surprised to see that when companies like Boeing announced a new airplane that has, let's say, a 15% improvement in fuel burn, compared to a previous airplane, a lot of the underlying benefits come from engines. So for example, the 787, which had a 15% fuel burn benefit over the 767, a lot of that came from propulsion technologies. Um, we then looked at the aerospace industry and we thought, wow, there's a lot of people working on relatively small airplanes, but unfortunately small airplanes, smaller than hundred passengers represent smaller than 5% of the carbon footprint of the entire aerospace industry. And in fact, actually, most of the carbon footprint of the aerospace industry is airplanes larger than 100 passengers, and in particular in what's called the narrow body segment. So that's the 737s, the, 7, uh, the A320s, a typical airplane like you might be on carries sort of 100 to 200 passengers. And so that's the industry that we work in. Um, for, you know, for, for sort of the business development people on this call, we're this is an enormous market. Uh, these are companies that are each worth $100 billion. Um, they're expected to be 30,000 new narrow body airplanes purchased over the next 20 years, billions and billions of dollars of jet engine sales per year and billions of gallons of jet fuel. So this is a large potential market opportunity if you could create the underlying technology. And so what's needed, number one, propulsion, and then number two, energy storage. Um, propulsion essentially being ultra lightweight engines, energy storage, or light, uh, ultra lightweight ways to store electricity. So this is our... Um, uh, electric engine that we built. Uh, it's basically meant to be a replacement of a jet engine of a narrow body class airplane. Um, so it's a couple of megawatts in power, which is about 3000 horsepower, substantially more powerful than anything that's out there in the aerospace industry. Um, In-house developed uh, inverter designed for high altitude operations. Um, just finished some testing at the FAA Technology Center and planning for um, FAA Part 33 certification um, in the 2025, 2026 timeframe. So that's kind of a little bit about what our company does. Um, what we're planning to do as our next step is we're taking a 100 passenger airplane and we're, uh, removing one of the four engines and replacing it with our electric engine to make it, uh, essentially an electric test bed. So this is one sort of quick point to the group. If anybody is working on propulsion technologies and is looking for a relatively inexpensive way to do testing, please reach out to us because we're already gonna have this platform in place 
um, and we're happy to do testing with you if you're working on technologies like this. Um, the nice thing about this airplane is it's a four engine airplane, but it can actually fly on three of the four engines. So we're using basically one of the four engines as a, um, as a laboratory in the sky. Um, I wanna talk now a little bit about energy storage requirements. Um, so no lithium ion battery is going to get to, you know, greater than 750 watt hours per kilogram. Um, typically, um, you know, a lithium ion battery, best case scenario is gonna get up to 400, 450, 500, sort of absolute best case scenario. So you really need to be looking at new chemistries um, and what, what this industry is really looking for is even above 1,000 watt hours or 1,500. You also need high C rates. You need relatively high discharge. It doesn't have to be as high as the vertical takeoff and landing airplanes, but you know, sort of three to five uh, Cs. Uh, also has to be altitude capable. And in terms of energy storage, what you really need is electricity. You don't necessarily care if it's a battery. So um, the two different technologies that have been mostly um, in development are sort of energy carrier technologies. Um, and then one quick note, if you look on the right, this is essentially the energy profile. So you, you have a huge amount of power um, up front during takeoff and climb out, and then you have about uh, a third of the power needed during cruise. And this is a similar path. So you see a huge spike in power needed right here, and then it sort of drops off for the power that's needed. It's about you know a third to a quarter of the power needed. So. Two different major technologies under development, and this is what we would encourage people in this group to work on. Um, I'm very happy to talk about this with people later. Number one, aluminum air fuel cells or other metal air chemistries, and number two, hydrogen fuel cells. So in terms of aluminum air, um, aluminum air is, is generally in the category of other metal air chemistries. Zinc air, for example, um, has been used in hearing aid batteries since the 1970s. Forum Energy is a company that's raised about $300 million, uh, maybe even more than that. Um, to focus on an iron air battery. So it's a new chemistry that's sort of a, it, it's, it's something, it's, it's old, but it's new. A lot of people are working in this space. And actually at the most recent US Department of Energy ARPA-E summit in uh, earlier this year, there was specifically um, uh, a group that, that was talking about putting together uh, funding related to this topic. The disadvantage of this is that you can't uh, recharge these batteries. Uh, you have to recharge them uh, by taking them. You can't recharge them by plugging them in. You have to recharge them by sending them back to a facility. So there's a lot of operational challenges with this, but at the same time, um, it's a major advantage. Um, I just have two more slides. Um, a lot of people are also working on hydrogen fuel cells. Uh, obviously, everybody knows what a hydrogen fuel cell is, but there's a lot of applications potentially in the aerospace industry. And um, people are looking at technologies that could be greater than a power density of two kilowatts per kilogram by 2030. And that's sort of what a lot of people think of as the number that's needed for large aerospace applications. So if you're working, for example, on ultra lightweight fuel cells, aerospace is a great industry for you to be in. The last thing I want to say in this space is there's a lot of money going into the space right now. So, you know, everyone wants to go get venture capital money. As I mentioned, Forum Energy um, has raised a whole bunch of money in this space. But Here's just um, four different opportunities or, or three different opportunities that are sort of live opportunities to raise money. If you're in Europe, there's the Clean Skies. Uh, I think they've put up 700 plus million euros work in this space. Um, ATI Fly Zero is a program out of the United Kingdom. The US Department of Energy is doing a lot of work. And then there's obviously other things as well. So we think this is a strong space because it's a huge potential market. There's a lot of money going into the space. and. Um, major opportunities to revolutionize the U.S. aerospace industry. So I'll pause there. Um, I wanted to keep this speech relatively short. Please feel free, feel free to reach out to me. Um, take down the email address. I'm not going to be able to stay for a breakout session, um, but if folks want to schedule a one-on-one -on -one call, I'm happy to do so. So thanks very much for the opportunity. Thanks, Jeff. You have a couple of questions here in the chat. Um, oh, how perfect. were your relationships with the DOE and the Air Force established? Oh, great question. Um, you know, so uh, let's see. We've had um, a few different contracts with NASA, a few different contracts um, with the Air Force and with the Army. Um, some of them are sort of serendipity. Um, NASA puts out a, a request for a proposal, and it's exactly the thing um, that you're working on. And that's it's sort of luck, but you know, it occasionally does happen. Um, but sometimes also you, you the, uh, these organizations have open solicitations. So for example, with the Air Force, 
um, we're, we're, we're being funded now to turn our to an ultra lightweight generator for them. And that came about because we found a unit within the air force that was looking for an ultra lightweight generator. We said, Hey, we could, we could do that for you. Um, and then we sort of put together a proposal together. So I would say it's, um, maybe the, the short answer is, um, some, uh, advice that, uh, that I was given during the YC batch, sort of try everything you can think of and then try it again and then try it again and try it again. Um, so it's, you know, it, it'd be nice to say like, oh, it's just an easy path, but really I'm just sort of trying over and over. Um, let's see, what do I think of the ion engines, which made flight a couple of years back? Um, I don't know as much about ion engines, but if you send me some information, I'd be happy to talk with you about it. Um, are, are these the ones that came out of MIT um, that are, uh, they, they, I think this is the concept that it's a, um, um, essentially a, a no moving air concept. If that's what you guys are talking about, I saw the video too, and it's like absolutely insane. Um, it looks like it's relatively small, um, but you know, obviously there's, there should be tons of money going into that space. Um, next comment, it could be cool to use a catapult. Agree 100%. Um, catapults or ramps or other things I think have a big opportunity. Um, it's just, that's a lot of infrastructure on the ground. Um, but no, I love that concept as well. Um, yeah, so that's, yeah, that's exactly, uh, that's the concept um, you were talking about. How does an engine compare to engines used for smaller planes like that were used for firefighting? Is it adaptable to that purpose? In fact, it is actually um, the airplane that we're, that we're working on this um, 100 passenger airplane called the BAE 146. So I'll go back to it. Um, it's actually used in the United States as a firefighting aircraft. So it is adaptable for that purpose. Um, and I think that's the last question. So thanks, everybody. Um, and next up, we have Max from Charge Robotics. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, first, I just want to say thanks to Paige for setting up this event. Um, my name is Max Justice, uh, co founder and CTO of Charge Robotics. Uh, we were in the Y Combinator summer 2021 batch. Um, and Charge Robotics uh, builds robots that build large scale solar farms. Uh, when I talk about large scale solar farms, I'm talking about like what you see in the background of this slide here. So these are pretty huge sites. Uh, they're often hundreds or thousands of acres large, um, generating hundreds of megawatts to sometimes gigawatts of power. Um, so a couple quick things to know just about the solar industry in the US. Uh, right now, about 4% of our power uh, in the US comes from solar. Um, and by 2050, it's going to be about half. So there is a tremendous amount of solar that needs to get built uh, in the next few years. Uh, the problem is that labor is actually the key bottleneck preventing uh, solar adoption right now. So if you think about it, it kind of makes sense. Like these sites are built often out in the middle of like very rural areas. Um, and getting hundreds of people out there for months or you know, sometimes years uh, at a time uh, is just really challenging. Um, and so you know, as Charge Robotics, like, I don't really know how to source 300 people to get them out to a solar site for a year, um, but I absolutely know how to ship a couple of shipping containers full of robotic equipment out there uh, to build the site. Uh, so that's kind of our thesis. We think that robots are the right solution uh, to solving this labor shortage. Um, so if we're talking about deploying robots to build solar farms, uh, I think it's important to kind of understand the sorts of tasks that these robots are going to be doing. Um, and so I want to talk about how solar is actually built today. Uh, there's kind of three main mechanical steps uh, that go into basically every solar farm that gets built. First is pile driving. So you send out a crew and they hammer these large metal I-beams into the ground in a, a huge grid. Uh, this covers the whole site. Then you send out another crew and they bolt uh, tens of thousands of these uh, large metal rails between the I-beams. Um, and those are actually what support the solar modules. Um, then you send out another crew and they bolt the hundreds of thousands of solar modules onto that racking structure. Uh, so those three steps are common to, again, basically every site that gets built today. Um, and I think one thing just to, to note here that's uh, kind of funny is that basically everything on a solar site is really heavy. Uh, so like a single solar module, um, like one of those rectangles weighs like 50 or 60 pounds. Um, so as a single person, like you really don't want to have to carry one very far. Um, and so what they do on these sites is called uh, material staging. So they send out crews with forklifts 
and they basically move pallets of materials kind of like close to where they need to go. Um, and the idea is that, you know, if I need to pick up a solar module, it's maybe only 10 feet from where it needs to end up. Um, and so what this made us realize is that kind of no matter how we're automating the solar industry, a key primitive that we're going to end up needing is this like stuff mover, this robot that can move things from point A to point B um, on the solar site. And so that's actually what we built uh, towards the end of last year uh, and beginning of this year um, is a, a giant robotic forklift. Uh, and that's kind of what I want to talk to you guys about today. Um, one second, I think I just realized that uh, I didn't have it in video clip sharing mode, so it might be a little choppy. All right. Uh, I'm just going to unshare and reshare really quickly. All right, that should be coming through a little smoother now. Um, so yeah, this is how we built that robot, our uh, robotic 25,000 pound forklift. Uh, so the vehicle of choice for this application uh, turns out to be this thing called the telehandler. Um, it's basically a big forklift. It has these massive tires. Um, and the kind of relevant thing to know about these is that they're already used on solar sites uh, today. So these are, are super common vehicles. Uh, they navigate crazy terrain. Um, and the construction workers on these sites kind of know how to, how to operate with these uh, already. Um, and if you're going to automate one of these vehicles, uh, there's a whole bunch of different systems that you have to control from software. Um, so you have the fork angle, um, as well as the boom extension angle. You need to be able to move those just so that you can pick up pallets. Uh, there's also steering, uh, throttle and brake, um, as well as gear shifting, because you need to be able to go from forward to reverse. So this is kind of like the bare minimum set of stuff that you have to control from software to be able to build this vehicle. Uh, the first system that I, I wanna talk about is the hydraulic system in the vehicle. So there were two systems uh, that we needed to control that were on the hydraulic uh, circuit here. Um, that's the steering and the brake. So for the steering, um, this is kind of the sort of complicated looking hydraulic circuit for the steering system in the top left here. Uh, we ended up deciding just in the interest of time uh, to basically bypass that entirely and uh, 3D print a custom bracket uh, to bolt to the steering column. Um, so this actually ended up working uh, great. Like we ended up 3D printing a bunch of different pieces uh, and then just buying an off the shelf motor and motor controller and gearbox uh, to control the steering. So this is kind of what we ended up with. This is actually what we shipped uh, to our first pilot deployment. Uh, the other hydraulic system was the brake. Uh, so similar to the steering, uh, we ended up mechanically actuating this. So we had a steel cable going from the brake pedal uh, to a, a linear actuator uh, sitting underneath the vehicle. Um, and what is sort of nice about this design is that if I'm a person sitting in the cab of the vehicle, I can jam on the brake uh, and this cable will just go slack and it'll still function like a normal brake pedal. And so this was actually a design philosophy that we decided to use uh, for all the systems in the vehicle that we could at least. So uh, for example, if you move the joystick as a person in the cab, uh, that manual input will actually override uh, any automated control of the vehicle. So this is kind of a, a philosophy to, to automating vehicles that we, uh, that we tried to use everywhere. Uh, the next systems that we automated that I, I wanted to talk about hey, Max, today. Um, sorry yep. to interrupt, I think there's a, I don't know if it's a Zoom window or something, but it's blocking part of your slide. Uh, is it on uh, the right-hand side? That guy, yeah, you're right on it now. Oh, okay, yeah, weird. That's the thing with all the faces in it. I'll just minimize that. Uh, that should be better. Cool. Yeah, so next I'll talk about the uh, electronic systems. So uh, that's the joystick, the throttle, and the gear shifter. So the, the first step in getting these systems working was to do uh, was to reverse engineer this thing called the CAN bus. Uh, this is a, a protocol that's common to basically every vehicle that you've ever been in. Uh, it's used to send data from system to system uh, inside the vehicle. And so if you want to take over control of some system inside the vehicle, you can figure out what CAN messages it's sending uh, and then send those messages for yourself. So the, the trick then becomes, how do you figure out what the relevant CAN message is? Um, and so what you can do is basically take all the CAN messages and graph them. 
Uh, and then if you move the relevant input or change some variable and you see, for example, a line on this graph like shoot up, then you know that uh, it's very likely you found the, the relevant message um, and you can start sending that message for yourself. For the signals that uh, weren't on the CAN bus, we built this uh, custom cable that sort of just uh, kind of went in between the, the main computer inside the cab and the rest of the vehicle. And then we could just splice into signals directly. Uh, and so when you tie all that work together, uh, you end up uh, with a vehicle that you can control completely from software. So um, this was uh, pretty shortly after we got the vehicle. Uh, do not try this at home. Uh, this was uh, when we got the, the boom working on the CAN bus. So we, we quickly kind of whipped together this interface uh, that I had on my phone. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I was able to, you know, take the telehandler for a ride uh, through remote control. And actually, when we were in Y Combinator, um, a, a demo that we, we put on was we sent that web page to one of our batch mates who was in Mexico, and she was able to control the telehandler from another country, which I thought was, was kind of funny. Uh, and there you can see kind of when we got the joystick working, we had it ripped out and everything's running off my laptop there. So this is, this is what the early days of uh, Charge Robotics looked like. So yeah, then we wrote uh, kind of a full autonomy stack and got this thing deployed onto an actual solar site in Iowa back in March. Um, so I'll skip through this video just because it's a little bit long, um, but we dock with uh, an actual pallet of solar modules. Uh, we do some path planning. We, uh, you can see the vehicle uh, following a path here and it's localizing off of some cameras that are mounted to the vehicle. We uh, drive to the final location and we put it down. So uh, yeah, this was uh, back in March. And with that deployment behind us, uh, we started moving on to our next major project, which is actually um, building this portable robotic factory. Uh, let's see if I can advance. Yeah, so a uh, portable robotic factory. Um, basically, there's a bunch of solar hardware that needs to get assembled on site. And so we're building uh, this factory that fits in the form factor of a shipping container uh, that we send out to the site and it produces those assemblies. So these are massive assemblies. Like I mentioned, everything on a solar site is heavy. Uh, these are 36 foot long uh, panels. They weigh uh, several hundred pounds. Um, and uh, yeah, <laughs> it, it's, it's basically like a car factory, like you'd see, you know, like an automated Tesla factory or something, uh, but made portable uh, such that we can ship it to a, a solar site. So here's one of the arms that we got uh, in the mail a couple of weeks ago. Um, so with that in mind, uh, if this is the sort of work uh, that sounds exciting to you, uh, we're currently hiring for mechanical engineers. Uh, so I'd love if you could uh, reach out uh, if this is the sort of thing you wanna be working on, but uh, thanks very much. Thanks, Max. We have some questions for you in the chat. Um, so sure Joshua is asking, does the one elevation or two terrain surface, especially uh, irregularities or slopes, limit your deployments? Got it. Um, so yeah, for the most part, these sites are quite flat, uh, just sort of by design. It adds a lot of cost to the site uh, if they have to do a lot of breeding. Um, so like if the land's not flat enough, they actually send out construction equipment to flatten the land. Uh, so it's, it's very well specced uh, how flat these sites are in general. Um, and for the most part, we are focused on the, the biggest, flattest sites. Um, what type, what type of, con of control theory are you using? PID, baby. PID <laughs> all day, every day. That's, uh, that's what we use to get this prototype working. Uh, as we kind of advance our technology, um, we're almost certainly going to be using some, some more advanced stuff. But uh, for the purpose of that prototype, it was all PID. Uh, and then uh, it was pure pursuit was the, the path following algorithm because we had a Ackerman steering vehicle. Um, so cool, how much time and labor does charge save a typical solar project site? Oh, sorry. Uh, how much time and labor does charge save a typical solar project site? Also curious who your first customers would be and why. Thanks, good luck. Yeah, so um, uh, it turns out that labor is something like 30% of the project cost, And of that, uh, mechanical installation is about half of that. So 
Uh, what's kind of crazy is that there's this labor shortage is big enough right now that we don't really need to charge less than human contractors uh, charge for people to be really interested in our product. Um, so, for example, uh, we signed some LOIs uh, with some of the largest solar construction companies in the country for about uh, $31 million. Uh, and those contracts were actually priced at the same price of, of human labor. Uh, so people are just desperate for more installation labor period. So we, we don't actually need to charge less than, than people. Um, how many fewer people are needed out of deployment site by using a robotic forklift? Some of the videos seem to show a few workers watching the forklift. Yeah, I, I was one of those people in that video. That was, uh, this was very much like a prototype deployment. Uh, this thing is not uh, ready to, you know, it's not a product yet. Um, our, our complete system uh, will require dramatically fewer people than, than conventional labor today. So a, a single one of our systems can do the work of, of something like uh, several dozen people. I, I, I hesitate to give an actual number, but our models uh, have it as, as something, I think it's like between 70 and 100 people. Um, and that's for a complete system. So that's like six of the, the robots that you saw. Uh, how are you controlling the forklift exact positioning? Uh, yeah, we're going to be using RTK GPS. Uh, so we weren't for that demo, but uh, all these sites have an RTK GPS base station on them. Um, so that's what we'll be using to aid our localization. Uh, how long does the forklift last per charge? Uh, how long does it take to charge fully? Uh, so fun fact, uh, they burn thousands of gallons of diesel per week on solar sites. Uh, we did the math to make sure that uh, these sites offset themselves relatively quickly. Um, but every vehicle that you see on these sites is, is diesel powered, including the one that we automated. Uh, what is the most labor intensive part of the entire project? Uh, so. You hear varying opinions on this, uh, but I would say the most popular opinion and the one that I share is that it's the module installation step. Uh, that takes a lot of work. Um, it's just those things are really heavy and you have like, you know, hundreds of thousands of them. Uh, so that's, I'd say, the most labor intensive part. Um, if there is that much of a shortage, can't you charge more? Uh, potentially. <laughs> that's a great point. Um, uh, very, very possibly, yeah. Uh, and also there's things that you can do with robotic installation that uh, it's easier for robots than for people. So, you know, one thing that we're excited about is we can produce a certificate that shows that literally every bolt on the site was torqued uh, to within the proper specifications, which like, you know, a person just can't really do very easily. Are you considering making an electric model? Um, right now we're mostly not focused on like building construction equipment. We're focused on uh, using off the shelf stuff wherever we can. I think it would be very cool if we could use off the shelf uh, electric construction equipment, but we have no plans to, to build that in the immediate future. Um, and then I think there's one last question. I've seen some projects that are also trying to automate the module installation with robots. Are you thinking about something like this in the future? Yes, so um, when I alluded to the robotic factory that we're building towards the end of my presentation, uh, that is the step that we'll be doing the module installation. So the robot that I showed you in that video was really a prototype uh, that did one thing well, which was move materials around. Uh, our goal is to do complete mechanical installation of the site. So that includes uh, eventually doing pile driving, installing all the racking structure, installing all the modules. So that's the, the vision of the company. Cool, I think that was it. Um, thank you guys very much. Uh, and again, if you're interested in working on this, uh, feel free to shoot me an email at max at chargerobotics.com uh, or just go to chargerobotics.com. We have a careers page, but uh, thanks again. And next up, we have Oliver Oliver from Impossible Mining. Hello, everybody. I'm super excited to be here. I'm Oliver. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Impossible Mining, and we are building underwater robot vehicles which collect battery metals from the seabed. And we're doing it in a way that really doesn't harm uh, the, the ecosystem that lives down on the seabed. Uh, we're actually a, a B Corp, um, and so that's really much, you know, very much in our DNA. So if we talk a little bit about the problem, I mean, we want everyone to drive an EV. Um, you know, we want to move away from fossil fuels and gas. And, and the good news is there's a lot of growth coming. Um, but the downside is that all of this needs a lot more critical minerals, battery metals. In fact, uh, uh, an EV needs something like six times the amount of metal of a traditional uh, gas vehicle, and that's really driven by the battery. And so we've got a need for all of this material, whilst we also want to have good ESG. 
We don't want to hurt the planet in the process of the transition. So the fundamental problem with the supply chain is the fact that we don't have enough of this material. The ESG characteristics are pretty poor and the material that does exist in the ground tends to be controlled by China. Uh, a lot of places in Indonesia and Africa are under the influence of China. So here in the West, we really need to solve this problem. So our approach is to really go after what are called polymetallic nodules. I'm actually going to hold one up on the camera here. So this is a rock that forms over millions of years on the seabed, and it's super rich in battery metals. Um, it actually is uh, the world's biggest resource of nickel and cobalt. Um, it also has copper and manganese. And there's estimated to be something like a hundred trillion dollars worth of these battery metals just lying on the seabed on the floor. So we don't have to blast or cut, we just have to pick them up. Now, the challenge in picking these up is how do you do it? And our competitors are basically building dredging technology. This is a, a short clip from uh, their approach. These are massive machines. They get, uh, they get lowered to the seabed floor and they generate all of these sediment plumes, these clouds of dust effectively that, that really destroy wildlife. And they indiscriminately remove everything by basically squirting water into the sediment and then sucking it up over this long riser tube. We don't like that approach. So what we're doing is we're building fully autonomous robots. And uh, here's a little animation of, of what we're building. So these robots would be launched from a traditional um, shipping container vessel. Uh, they're fully autonomous. They have a battery pack. They have a built-in buoyancy engine that allows them to go up and down. And we use a parallel fleet. You can see others returning. Once they get to the seabed, they don't actually touch the seabed. They use the buoyancy engine to maintain neutral buoyancy. And then they use cameras and AI to selectively pick up the rocks, avoiding any that contain life. Uh, this could be sponges uh, or corals or other forms of life. And we actually leave behind a certain percent to maintain the habitat. Once the payload is full, the battery pack adjusts the buoyancy engine to make the vehicle float to the surface where it's recovered. Uh, now the payload will be emptied, uh, the battery pack will be swapped, and any maintenance is performed. And now the vehicle can be redeployed on, on the next mission. Um, and so, you know, we're basically building the team in Canada to build these robots. And we're just in the process of testing our first proof of concept. Uh, we were a, a YC Winter 22 company. Um, and so we announced uh, just a few weeks ago that we had closed over $10 million in, in funding. So we're quite well funded at this seed stage. And now we have to build these proof of concepts. And, and so we have four uh, roles that are currently open um, in Collingwood. So Collingwood is a, a town north of Toronto, actually on the Georgian Bay. And we've just rented a very large 10,000 foot square foot. Uh, facility and this is where we will be building these robots and and so if anybody uh, is in the area and, and is interested please spread the word uh, we'd love to have you come and join us and and help us deliver this vision of making it easy and less environmentally damaged for everyone to drive an EV okay thanks I will attempt to answer any questions let me see let me scroll back um, okay Dimension size of these nodules. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm holding one up. They are about two inches diameter. Uh, they vary a little bit, but they're relatively small. Um, they form over millions of years. There's like huge numbers of them. Uh, what is the relative density against the water? Um, they they have they are they have some some weight. So they're just lying. You know, they're rocks. They lie on the seabed, uh, not attached, but they're there. Uh, will we must control the food? Uh, we rent. Um, we have designed our robots so that they will work with traditional shipping containers. Uh, and that's a big part of lowering the cost of collection. Um, and so we need minor modifications to a traditional shipping container vessel. And we also use that vessel to not only launch 
and recover the vehicles to charge them, but also to transport the payload, the actual nodules, uh, to port where they'll be processed uh, in to get the metals out. Um, uh, how deep is the machine able to go? So, uh, unfortunately, these nodules, these rocks, they only form in areas of water that have been that for millions of years, typically three to five millions of years. And so that means they have to be deep. So the typical depths are about uh, 5,000 to 6,000 meters. So, you know, three and a half to four and a bit miles deep, very, very deep. Uh, are you using RGB cameras or hyperspectral? We're using RGB. Uh, at that depth, there is no light, um, and so we provide our own illumination. Uh, we're using visible light and potentially infrared, um, and just using traditional images. Uh, how are you treating the biologics? What will be on the surface? Um, not 100% sure about this. I mean, there are lots of studies that show there are corals, there are sponges, and there's also other forms of fauna that lay eggs. Um, and so our AI will detect these and avoid picking up those nodules. Uh, we will also choose to leave a certain percent behind. We're working with a team of marine scientists to kind of co-design this collection vehicle. Uh, how environment economically viable is this versus others, uh, rare earths? Um, yeah, we think it's really economic. Um, we want to be about a third of the cost of the dredging. But if you take a brand new mine on land, there are real issues with that. First of all, in the US, it takes eight to 12 years to permit, mainly because nobody wants a mine in their backyard and you often have to displace people, often indigenous people, and so that goes through the courts. So we think the permitting will be a lot quicker. Secondly, we have a very high grade resource. Uh, this nodule has nickel, cobalt, copper, and manganese at much higher grades than we find on land. Uh, all the high grade metals on land have already been mined. Uh, also on land, they're typically very remote, so you have to build a lot of infrastructure, you have to build a train line or a highway, uh, to get there. And on land, you don't typically find four metals in one. So all of this things will come out to be much less costly. Uh, who owns the rights to the minerals? Great question. Uh, there are two jurisdictions. If it's within the exclusive economic zone of a country, i.e. 200 nautical miles off its coast, it belongs to the country. If it's outside of that, it's in areas beyond national jurisdiction or the high seas. It's regulated by a United Nations body, called the International Seabed Authority, or the ISA. And uh, they were established in the 1990s, and they have issued something like 32 exploration permits. Uh, are these on international waters? Uh, yeah, okay, so yeah, if uh, two jurisdictions, you're in international waters, it's regulated by the ISA, or you're in the jurisdiction of a country, uh, like the Cook Islands, uh, that has established their Seabed Minerals Authority that is issuing permits and regulating. Uh, can these rocks be treated in existing facilities to extract the minerals or you need new facilities? Great question. Um, you need some modification of the traditional refining, but actually we also have a team that is trying to do a really innovative way to do this using uh, naturally occurring breathing, uh, metal breathing um, bacteria. So we have a team in LA that is attempting to uh, to do that. Uh, why are you not using sonar? Um, we actually do have sonar on the vehicle and that's mainly for when it is being um, deployed uh, to make sure that it doesn't hard impact the seabed. It's for maintaining neutral buoyancy uh, but specifically we feel that uh, RGB camera works better for the vision system in, in picking up and the fact that we control our own uh, lights uh, means that it's relatively easy. Uh, how long are you out to sea? How much material do you harvest per haul? Uh, we will do about 3 million metric tons in a year. That will generate about 2 billion in revenue. Uh, we have a cycle time of about two weeks. So every two weeks the ship is coming and a new crew is going on station. Uh, won't you require extra metallurgical isolation? Yeah, we talked about that. We have something called bioextraction uh, that we're working on to do that. 
White Collingwood, um, incredible engineering, talent. Uh, the University of, of Waterloo is, is very close by and that's where our CTO went um, and, and also access to the Georgian Bay. Uh, environmental purpose of these rocks, are they part of an ecosystem? Uh, yes, um, life has evolved uh, to use them. As I mentioned, there, there is life that uses them to lay eggs. It's the only hard substrate. And so it's really critical in our approach that we don't remove all of them. We leave a certain percent behind so that life can exist. Uh, um, do you intend LBS or other spectral density analysis? Um, we don't need to choose which rock to pick up. The percentage of the metal in each rock doesn't vary from one rock to the next. They're all pretty much the same. So the distinction to pick up the rock or not is based on whether any life is on it or we want to leave it behind. Uh, good on you for knowing your numbers. Uh, how far away from building the prototype? Um, we built for YC at the start of this year, um, we built the arm in the test tank and we now have the shallow water proof of concept in the water. Uh, we are hoping to be able to demonstrate that in the fourth quarter of this year. Um, okay, why 7%? I don't know what that refers to. But uh, anyway, I should probably stop there and um, hand over. You know, please feel free to, to reach out to me. Um, you know, my email is, you can reach me at um, oliver at um, impossiblemining.com. In this next portion of the event, we will have two quick pitches to hear about two other climate companies. Uh, we'll start with Inza at Muji Meets. I am Inza, I'm CEO and co-founder of Muji Meets. As you probably know, meat is one of the biggest drivers of climate change. But fortunately, nowadays we have meat alternatives. Um, so you probably all heard of companies such as Impossible and Beyond. But you might also have heard that on top of that, that grown meat is a big emerging trend. The entire meat alternative industry has one big problem, though, which is they can't produce good whole cuts. So if you go to your local supermarket and you look at the real meat section, you see like steaks, fillets, chicken breasts, whatever. But if you look at meat alternatives, you will find only ground meat and maybe some sausages and patties. Muji Meat is a habit spin-off that develops a scalable 3D printing process to produce whole cuts at mass production level. And just to give you a sense of how cool the technology we're working on is, um, we do have a corresponding nature publication that completely blew up and it broke the record for most number of readers a nature paper ever had in the first month after publication. And yeah, we are a growing team. We hire a large variety of backgrounds from electrical engineers to bioengineers to food scientists. So if you have any of these profiles or are just generally interested in our mission, um, I'm happy to get in touch with you. Does anyone uh, have one question for Inda? Can you please describe what the printer is like? Okay, yeah. Um, so there's two main differentiators that are relevant for us. So for once, you probably know 3D printers, most of them have only one nozzle per printing head, and we print with more than 250 nozzles at print, at, per printing head, which sounds very easy, but there's a very complicated pressure regulation system behind that. The other main differentiator is that we can do the material switch within each nozzle up to 50 times per second, um, which is much faster than if you all only have one material per printing head and always need, need to relocate that. And it also enables much more precise um, structures and textures, if that makes sense. Um, and next up, we have Josh. Hey, everybody. Great to be here. Thanks for uh, allowing me to present. And I'm Josh Santos, the co-founder and CEO of Noya. And uh, Noya converts existing cooling towers into carbon vacuums. If you have never seen a cooling tower before, they look kind of like this. They, for our purposes at least, are basically just big boxes with huge fans that move lots of air. We take advantage of this moving stream of air sitting on top of a facility that has already been constructed to capture carbon dioxide directly out of the atmosphere. We do that with a machine that looks kind of like this. Our machine consists of a few key components that we are developing entirely in-house. We're developing something we're calling the contactor, where air plus 
our carbon capture material contact each other and come together. That material gobbles the CO2 up as it's passing through our equipment on its way into the cooling tower. The second thing we develop is a way to move the material from the contactor beyond to where it needs to go. Our material is a solid, and so we're basically using some fancy conveyor belts. Think um, conveyor sushi, but for climate. The last piece of equipment we're developing is something called a CO2 regenerator. It's called that because it regenerates the CO2 that we capture into a pure stream. It also regenerates the material that we are using so that we can use it again to gobble up more CO2. Uh, I would be a bad CEO if I told you that this is exactly what it's going to look like. It's not. Uh, it's the vision, but we are designing to this, and we just uh, finished our, our first build, and we're hiring lots of folks. We got um, different kinds of engineers, like chemical, mechanical, electrical, manufacturing, controls, and uh, we're hiring some material scientists as well. Um, we're hiring the electrical engineer actively, and the rest are coming later on this year. So if you're interested in cooling towers or uh, carbon capture, Let's talk. You can see my email there. And uh, that's probably my 60 seconds. Does the load change during use? I'm not sure exactly what load. Uh, you're, you're probably referring to the cooling load <laughs> or the electrical load required to cool. Um, um, and then where are you storing the solid end product? I know I said uh, one question, but. All good. So <laughs> the, the cooling tower with our equipment retrofitted is designed to be able to perform up to 95% or more of its peak cooling capacity. We're able to do that because of the specific type of material that we're using that essentially provides both a low pressure drop across the material and also a high surface area as air is flowing through it. Uh, we actually store CO2 in a gaseous form, uh, excuse me, on the liquid form. Uh, it's regenerated as a gas, we then compress into liquid and we store that in a big tank in the surface area of the buildings or industrial sites that we are uh, retrofitting.